Uh, you have to understand, too, we also have the biggest and the best found funded military. And with that, peacekeeping is a very complex position. It's not necessarily an easier complex. And we will get into a lot more of that a little bit later. So we want to start with the challenger today. Um, the challenger is something that I, I do remember very well. Um, and it's funny because they're still young and I, I remember this happening and I remember knowing that I didn't really understand completely like that I wasn't of an age to understand just like the finality of something like this. I didn't know these people. And I remember um, my mom like, talking about it. But anyway, when we were we were off for a snow day. So if you don't know much about the challenger, this was kind of this big space expedition. And uh, they, what they did is they had this contest. Uh, they took the first science teacher, and they were taking the first science teacher in space. And so this is Christy McAfee. This is she. She is right here. And uh, to point this out, too, the gentleman that's next to her here, he was, this was not his first flight into space. He was, he was the first person of Japanese descent. To go into space. When I was in Hawaii at the Japanese Cultural Center, they had kind of a big thing connected to him there because he was Hawaiian and he uh, was in Japan. So he became the first person of Asian descent who actually went into um, onto the moon. And so he had been before. This was not his first trip, but I thought that was kind of cool because never really knew anything about the other people that are there with her because her name is just kind of the one that gets so much press with this. And so this was this big idea. This space was being made obtainable. You know, it was going to become a more realistic thing. And so uh, the Challenger had a lot of problems trying to get it up and running. They were having issues. And ex space exploration. And so they kept, you know, nope, we're not going to go. We're not going to go. And a lot of times. And a lot of times. When people keep delaying things, you know, there are people behind you going, we just need to go. We just need to go because people are asking, well, this is happening. And every time you delay one of those events, you're money, more money. And, you know, it's easy to look back now and say this is the wrong decision. But, you know, you've probably been involved, too, when people are overly cautious about things. However, this was not one of those times. So they had rescheduled it. I believe it was three times. And there was this weird... Um, it was in January and uh, 1996, and there was this weird frost that hit Florida. As you don't know, the Challenger is down in Cape Canaveral now. We barely get to freezing here. Maybe if we get to it, it's like, what, once a year? That it literally gets enough to where, like, we might get in the 30s, but to get to where things freeze, you know, 32 degrees is the temp at which things start to freeze realistically to get a real freeze you really kind of have to get you know a little below that and stay below that and but there were there was ice chips inside um i think it was a lodge but anyway there were ice chips there were things that and that's what's going to end up causing the problems and so they refused to delay again because they had to delay so many times and they're like no it's going to be fine it's going to be fine and even with the ice chips i believe that they if i remember correctly they thought that the ice chips would kind of melt off and it would work itself out. And you'll, I mean, I could get why you would think that because, you know, that sucker's about to heat up. I mean, it's, it is going to have a basic engine kind of explosion there. So it should heat up and be okay. So at any rate, in North Alabama, where I lived in 1986, there was such a strong snow for us. Well, there had been a snow. It wasn't a very big snow, but it was enough that they, that we were out of school for the day. So they let us out of school for the day, and because uh, I mean, some of the roads were iced in different places. And anytime there's ice on the road, you can't ride buses, so you can't have school. So they had let school out for the day, and we were actually visiting. Um, we were at the house of some of my parents' friends that were a couple houses down when we first saw this, because my parents didn't have cable TV, which was a whole nother whatever. Still bitter, but uh, sitting there watching this, and so I remember seeing kind of the end footage that it was kind of replaying. And my mom said, oh, it's just so sad. And I'm like, okay, I don't get it. It just didn't really comprehend what it was. But I do remember seeing this on television. And, well, and really, you don't understand death until you understand death. 
And when people, especially when you're younger, when people you don't know die, you just don't really feel connected, if that makes sense. It's like, okay, they're dead, you know. So, but so let's, um, let's, we're going to watch some footage today. You are going to see the plane or the, it blow up. If that makes you uncomfortable, you do not have to watch. I think you're going to see it blow up. Did I not? I pulled up the Challenger. Did I? I may have reloaded on that same thing. Why do you have Columbine? Because we're going to talk about Columbine. I understand. Let's wait and talk about it when we get to it. All right, stay with me. So, this is the live CNN footage. Solid, uh, so, if you were at home, gimbal now underway. This is what you would have seen on television. T-minus 15 seconds. We have main engine start, four, three, two, one, and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. is now on the way after more delays than NASA cares to count. This morning, it looked as though they were not going to be able to get off. One minute, 15 seconds, velocity 2,900 feet per second, altitude 9 nautical miles, downrange distance 7 nautical miles. Well, he's Looks like a couple of the uh, solid rocket boosters uh, blew away from the side of the shuttle in an explosion. Flight controllers here looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have no downlink. Well, I mean, let me just say this. If you're going on a, I'm not saying they should or shouldn't, but if you're going on a spaceship, you're going to know there's that risk. I mean, there these are not the first astronauts that died. Hopefully they find a way first. Oh, <laughs> oh I, I bet when Christy signed up for that thing, there were all sorts of, if you died in this, she's like, yeah, that's not going to happen. But like, there were, there were several astronauts who died in the attempts in space. There is, there was another one. Was it Columbia? Um, in the 2000s somewhere, there was another spaceship that exploded as well. And I don't remember what happened. I think it was like Columbia is the name that I have in mind. I don't know why Challenger is one that just kind of really sticks out so much. There was one of the early astronauts um, died. And so, you know, you do have these incidents of tragedy that take place. So this is high risk. Uh, let's just say your insurance probably would go up. So, all right. So at any rate, this is the Challenger explosion. Um, it does. It is a big deal in, in the 80s because it is, sometimes things like this remind you of the type of things that can happen as well. All right. So moving along, did we, how much did we talk about the end of communism? Did we end communism, but we didn't tear down the wall, right? No, we, we I know we did the Reagan speech, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Where he says, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down the wall. I, I yeah. Well, and I don't think we watched the Hasselhoff video. I think that's no, – all right. So a little quick side note that I think is really kind of fun about the Berlin Wall. Uh, the Berlin Wall actually doesn't come down until George Bush is president. It officially comes down November 9, 1989. Communism had already – the Cold War had been declared over. And so there's this whole interesting story, and I couldn't find a really good article on it. But basically what kind of happens is there is a misunderstanding – with some of the um, some of the soldiers that are located in Germany, and they're pretty much like, well, I guess we, you know, that we can let them tear the wall down now, and it kind of gets miscommunicated. So then they go and tear down the wall, and so, but right, but not long before that happened, David Hasselhoff gets involved. He was a celebrity at the time. Uh, he's been involved. His he was famous at the time for a couple of different shows. One was a show called Night Riders. And Night Rider was one of the big yes. kind of like hits of the, the 80s for sure with his car kit. Uh, and then after that, he went in to do Baywatch. And so we're, it was he and other people who were definitely not clad for rescue that would run down the beach in slow motion. Mm -hmm. you know? And so, but Hasselhoff was, he was actually born in Germany. His parents were German. Thus, the name Hasselhoff is not exactly... You know, it's, it's a pretty German sounding name. And so he, because he wants to make this big stand about the Berlin Wall, he gets this concert set up over in West Berlin. And he actually stands on the wall and he sings this old German song that was translated into English. I've been looking for freedom. And so he sings this, he gives this whole concert. He has the light up jacket and the, Believe it or not, these like piano key scarves were like all. I remember seeing them on television uh, during this era. They were really popular, kind of like that Full House era. You may see some of those. Like it was, you were a cool guy if you wore the the piano key scarf. And so he has the cool piano key scarf, and he has this cool light up jacket. And so a few months after he gives this concert, the wall officially comes down. So David Hasselhoff felt like he did a lot to help the wall come down. So. He, uh, when they started the Berlin Wall Museum a few years ago, he went to the Berlin Wall Museum, people who were founding it, and he offered, it's a very small building, and he offered to donate his jacket for them to display. And they kind of said, no, that's okay. I kind of find that funny a little bit. It's like, yeah, we're good. You know, but at the same time, it's a pretty cool jacket. So I'm going to show you the video of him singing up and looking for freedom in Berlin. And you're also going to see him almost get hit by a rocket. So it's a win-win, right? No. You're welcome. All right. Isn't he like the dude in court in reality or something? When money in Jericho 20 years ago, I was a rich man's son. I had everything that money could buy. With freedom, I have none. I think the people are freedom. I think the people are freedom. You feel like some Hasselhoff is better? I don't even read the movie. They don't feel it. It's where he sings on the Berlin Wall. Oh! November 9th. My birthday. It's when the wall came down. It's when the wall came down. That's what I'm going to forget that day. But yeah, I think maybe not. I think it's 
second, 218. Wait for it. And like that picture just showed they're on top of this. It's coming, wait for it. Not that one. Watch that again. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it was three eighteen. Or and here we go. Again. <laughs> when you bend at the right point, right? Like that was not on purpose. Although it, I, that's my favorite part of it is when he always gets shot by the rockets. So, so he's been looking for freedom, and the wall comes down. All right, so all of you will go and I'm sure add that to all of your playlists. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, I've been looking for freedom. All right. So moving along, a couple other things. Um, we read about the other day the Iran-Contra affair under Reagan. So why was this kind of a hot mess? What happened here? Yay. What happened with the Iran Contra affair? Uh, let me get a All right, let's kind of flash back. So, oh no, no, not that Iran. That's Iran hostage. Although it sounds the same, and it's the same slightly same. No, no. No, this one probably should have gotten Reagan impeached. Actually, so it is a little different. Yes. Okay, so Congress passed a law that said we would not what. Nice. It was like negotiate with it's not those exact words, but it's not far. It's basically the Contras were revolutionaries. We didn't use the word terrorists. And they were trying to overthrow what country? It's in them it's in um it's in Latin America. Oh. Uh, I don't live there. Starts with an N. Nicaragua. 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 So they're trying to overthrow Nicaragua. We do not like the government of Nicaragua. Reagan likes these people. He wants to help them. But he can't because Congress passes the law that's like, we're not going to give money to revolutionaries. He like sees them like American revolutionaries. And so he feels like that it's the right thing to do. And so they passed this bill to send money to Iran. And what did they do with some of that money? Yeah, they send it to the Contra. They send weapons to the Contra. Now, this is controversial for two reasons. One, the law was, our Congress said not to, not to help revolutionaries. And the second is, what is it called when you put money in one place and it's going to another? I know that's right, but... Yeah, it's in, yeah, embe embezzling. I was like, embellishing? That's not it. Embezzling. Yes. And so... This gets to be a big deal. Oliver North, this is he. He is uh, he is fired for this. There are a couple other people who are fired for this. Reagan himself never uh, really gets hardcore busted for it. And then something that's a little controversial, when Bush comes in, the Contra affair had basically mostly fizzled. But Bush does go ahead and he pardons Reagan. Don't they have a trial? So, not with Reagan. Because you can't have a trial with the president unless you yeah. 
And peach. Why? why? why I thought you said lie. I was like, no, I said, why? why? Because the, that's if the president commits a crime that is serious enough, Congress will try them to determine whether or not they should impeach him. And they did not try it. They did not take him to impeachment. But why Congress? That's in Congress over like most times like half of the supporters or half of the people against him. Or that'd be really okay, so the issue here is the way Congress and the president were intended to be political parties were not in the original vision. Right. And so this becomes very complicated. Yeah, like, but what, what we know happens now, and it's happened in every impeachment trial, is that people side with their sides. Exactly. Like, you know. And see, I think I made the statement, I don't know if it was in this class or the other class the other day, if, if Nixon would have gone to trial, it would have been very interesting because he obviously did something very illegal. And so it would have been interesting to see if his party would have voted to remove him. I mean, Pence did unfollow Trump on Twitter. <laughs> that, but that's, that's post, so that's it pretty so intense. Petty. It was so great. <laughs> yep. All right. So let's talk about another thing that uh, Reagan does. Reagan appoints the first female member of the Supreme Court, and her name is Sandra Day O'Connor. <clears throat> so Sandra Day O'Connor becomes the first female on the Supreme Court. Um, and so I, we already have the first African-American on the Supreme Court. They're actually going to replace him kind of soon here. Uh, but that was, um, I didn't think of Clarence Thomas. He's the second. Thurgood Marshall. So Thurgood Marshall had been the first African-American appointed to the Supreme Court. He made a name for himself at Brown versus Board. He was the attorney. And now you have Sandra Day O'Connor, the first female. All right. So moving along, uh, Reagan finishes his second term. The truth is, at the end of Reagan's second term, he kind of just kind of starts to disappear. You don't see him as much. The truth is, is that by this point, it is uh, his family knew that he had the beginning stages of Alzheimer's and dementia. And which is very sad. Uh, Reagan wasn't after he left the White House. He didn't get to be the traditional Post president, especially with as beloved as he was, because he just, you know, he started to lose part of that um, mental capacity. And so I know his family didn't want him to be seen as anything other than kind of the beloved figure. And I remember one of the last public appearances he made, um, kind of being a big deal with that. But they kind of kept it very quiet for quite some time. Uh, but he had started to show some symptoms of that. I believe he had actually Alzheimer's, not dementia, but it started to show some symptoms of that in the end of his presidency. And so they were very cautious about him speaking. And um, But one of the things that I find interesting, and I think it was the other class where we discussed that, not this one, I believe, that a lot of times people who have those type of symptoms, um, they hold their humor. And I know, like, my grandmother, uh, who lived to be 94, 95, she had... I don't know if it was dementia or Alzheimer's. I don't, they said dementia. I don't know. But the last probably 15 years of her life, she was slipping. And then towards the end, like a visit was, who are you? I'm your granddaughter. Oh, you're my granddaughter. That's wonderful. This is my granddaughter. Who are you? I mean, it was, it was just, it was like the memory of goldfish. And I don't mean that as harsh or as cruel, but up until like, until she didn't have the capacity to function more than that, she was still funny and witty and, she would go into the doctor's office and he would say, all right, Ms. Thomason, what day is it today? And she's like, don't you have a medical degree? You should know that. <laughs> and if she didn't know the answer, she was always still just like witty and sassy. And so it's interesting how different parts of the brain are affected with these diseases. But so Reagan was still pretty good on his feet when he didn't know the answers to things. But they didn't want him like in intensive questioning sessions where he could not respond appropriately as president. So, um He's going to be followed up by his vice president, George H.W. Herbert Walker here. He had the pedigree to be president. Uh, if there's ever been somebody who, if you look at their resume and you're like, you know what, that guy might make a good president. Uh, first of all, he joined in World War II to serve in the Air Force. Um, he married Barb. He and Barb got married. And uh, they, they were the longest, I believe they had the longest marriage of any president and first lady. They were married like 60-something years. They were both in their 90s when they died semi-recently. He and Carter were exactly the same age. And so in 92, he runs. And um, he also, in World War II, 
not only was did he serve in the war, he was a war hero. He was shot down in enemy territory. And basically, like, tree bark ate his way back to, like, safety kind of thing. Like, it's one of those, like, amazing. His, his war service story is really pretty amazing. And so he's a World War II hero, which had a whole other level of respect. You know, at, now they're mostly deceased, but that was a big deal. Then he became an ambassador. He served as a U.S. ambassador. He also had served as a governor. He also had been the head of the CIA at one point. So those are some pretty impressive things. And he has been the vice president under the most popular president in U.S. history, other than, like, Washington. <laughs> and, well, actually, yeah. Uh, in fact, Reagan came the closest to having a perfect election, as did Washington had one. And then um, the uh, Arab Good Feeling president, which was um, Monroe, because Monroe had one guy who didn't vote for the other guy, but he refused to vote for Monroe because he just didn't want to have a unanimous electoral college. That's kind of hard to beat. So Reagan only lost uh, one state and one electoral vote in a different state in that second election. So let's talk about George H.W. Bush. Now, one of the things presidents have to be very cautious about today, especially with the media, Everything you say and do is public. You, I mean, you have no privacy whatsoever. And especially things that you say in a speech. So George H.W. Bush makes a famous speech that I'm going to show you a clip from. And it is his, it is his big promise to Americans. Oh, but this one is a big one. I'm the one who will not raise taxes. <laughs> My opponent now says he'll raise them as a last resort or a third resort. But when a politician talks like that, you know that's one resort he'll be checking into. And I, She's a great one. My opponent, My opponent won't rule out raising taxes, but I will and the Congress will push me to raise taxes and I'll say no, and they'll push and I'll say no, and they'll push again and I'll say to them, read my lips. No. So they'll push him and he'll say no, and they'll push him and he'll say no, and they'll push him and he'll say, read my lips. No new taxes. Does he end up raising taxes, though? Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to what I consider the golden era of Saturday Night Live. And this is Dana Carvey doing George H.W. Bush. Actually, if I put Saturday Night Live on there, it will block it. I won't let him see it. Um, it's weird how they can pick that up. Oh, yeah, I've had this more than once. Like, if I show a clip from, like, the Jimmy Fallon clip I always do with the um, – the Mexican session territory. If I ever put it on there, it will pick up and say you have copyrighted material in this. Hmm. Every time. The following is a special message from the President of the United States. Good evening, my fellow Americans. You know, in the past, when I've spoken to you from this office here, the news has always been good, not bad. Good. Berlin Wall, collapse of communism, that Noriega thing over there. Good, good, good. It's no wonder I'm up, up around that 80% approval area. But now tonight, the news I have to bring to you, it's not good. In fact, it's kind of bad. Maybe after you hear it, my, my approval rating will slip down to 75%. <laughs> little joke there for you. Now, during my campaign for president, certain things were said. Things like, read my lips, no new taxes. And when I said it, I meant it. I meant all three words. I meant no. I meant no. I meant taxes. I meant them all. But situations change. Spring becomes summer. Sunny days become cloudy up there. Sincere growth projections prove overly optimistic. 
expenditures that continue to grow up here, right there. Those there's expenditures right in that area. Revenues remain flat right down here. See this gap here? That's what I want to talk about. This budget deficit, the most frightening thing I've ever seen in my life, right here. Doesn't go away. You can move it. Still the same size. Flip it, turn it, throw it up, do anything you want. Don't think I haven't tried. Still there. You can move it, move it in and out. Results are always the same. We got that debt thing happening. We need cash. Lots of cash. Sort of, sort of boggles my mind. But don't fear. Got a plan. Got a good plan. Gonna tell you right now. Not avoiding it. Gonna come at you with it. Ready to tell you. Let the telling begin. Gonna come out with it. Here it comes. <laughs> gonna tell you. Not afraid. Read my lips. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna raise. Ra <laughs> I'm gonna ra raise. I'm gonna raise. I'm gonna raise there I said it loud and clear now you might ask me who's the money gonna come from could tax the poor haven't got the money wouldn't work the rich tax them all you want they're slippery suckers they incorporate meal deductions. They'll, they'll laugh at you. <laughs> Don't want to be laughed at by a tax lawyer down there doing that laughter thing he does. That leaves us with the beautiful middle class, dependable, always there, family people. Don't know about keeping receipts. <laughs> Don't have a lot of paper laying around. Solid people. Don't think we don't love you, you little taxpayers. <laughs> Now, of course, the Democrats are going to urge a big tax increase, 8, 10, 12 percent. Not God that. I'm talking 3, 4 percent tops, no more than 5. That's it. So read my lips. No huge new taxes. So to sum up, Berlin Wall down, communism collapsing, Noriega behind bars, gap. Dan Quayle still gaining acceptance. <laughs> no huge new taxes. That's right, live from New York. It's Saturday night. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Dan Quayle was his vice president, and as a whole, Dan Quayle was kind of viewed by Americans as not that smart. Um, he did a thing, and you know, and sometimes like. You know how sometimes your worst mistakes are what people catch on television, not your best moments. And so what they do with him is he is like presenting to these school kids and he writes potato and puts an E on the end of it. And so it became kind of a big joke with Dan Quell. So dummy can't spell potato like that was, you know, because, because we are very kind to people in the media. Right. Yeah. OK, so read my lips. No new taxes. Bush was extremely popular. Very right. He is right. His popularity rating was one of the highest ones since they started doing polls. He was very popular. So why does he not get reelected? Good question. So glad you asked that. So let's get there. Okay. So at the time he's there, um, communism is falling in lots of places. And this is when the students are even demonstrating in China, where if you've if you've seen that before, there's this incident where they are demonstrating in Beijing at Tiananmen Square, and the government actually killed some of them, but it shows that the people even there are unhappy with communism. So we feel like we're winning. We're having a historical experience in this green room. That's okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, get your crap and go. All right, just kidding. We had already talked about it. I'm not just looking at it. And, um, all right. So, um, Bush, read my lips, no new taxes, the wall falls. He does have to raise taxes. It is what it is. Uh, let's talk one other thing about him, and then we'll come to the Persian Gulf. 
One really positive thing that happens under George H.W. Bush is the Americans with Disabilities Act. We have talked about this a little bit when we talked about, we did the charts. Remember the charts? And we talked about people with disabilities and things that are going to happen for them. This is a huge moment. This act passed under Bush in, I believe, 1992 is the date I have specifically in mind when this passes. This said that you could not be discriminated against for jobs or anything else based on physical disability. Now, what that means, for instance, is if it is a job you're able to do. So let's say it is a job in a steel plant where you're expected to lift 50 pounds. If you're not capable of lifting 50 pounds, they do not have to hire you. But that has to be part of the job description. So if you can't physically, if it is a physical job and it is the type of labor that you can't do, then yes, they can discriminate against you in that way. But it's not really, it's more that you're not qualified, right? However, uh, if it is a job that does not require that, they cannot discriminate about you. I'm sure most of you know Ms. Brooks that works in the office, Shadell. Uh, if you haven't seen Shadell, Shadell is in an electric wheelchair. She's a founder of an organization called Dreams that is about people with disabilities. She came through PHS. Uh, she came through our school district here all the way, I believe, from kindergarten up. Uh, and she is at, finished up at South Alabama. And so, you know, she was hired because everything that that job requires, she can do. And so if you are physically capable or if you are capable of doing the job, now this can also include mental disabilities. It isn't just necessarily physical. It can also include a person who has mental disabilities. There are some jobs a person with mental disabilities, probably depending on the disabilities, probably doesn't need to do, right? But there are other jobs where people can function just fine. And so this says that you cannot discriminate against someone based on those things. Um, they cannot ask you about like certain health issues that you have um, when you apply for a job. If you volunteer that information, can it be used against you? No, but they don't have to tell you why they didn't hire you. And so this is why uh, those are certain things that when you apply for jobs now, if it is something you physically cannot do and they say, here are the requirements of the job and you can't do that, then you have to let them know. I know when I worked retail, one of the requirements was that you had to be able to lift at least 20 pounds. Not because you're going to be dead lifting, but because you're going to have to move stuff and load things, right? And so we had to be able to lift at least 20 pounds. Uh, if you were physically unable to do that, then they didn't need you swinging stuff around and getting yourself hurt, right? And so this would be a requirement. All right. Uh, yes. This is why we have uh, handicapped parking. It is why we have ramped. It is why, like, any time there is a show, performance, whatever, you have to have, um, gosh, I forget the exact term for it now because it's changed, but you have to have basically disability accessible seating. Like, every theater, you know, has a place that a person... Uh, who has a wheelchair can park their wheelchair basically. Um, everything is a lot more accessible than it used to be. And I believe I shared with you guys when we talked about the, the disability thing about uh, that is why like buildings are more likely to have elevators. It's because you have to have things accessible for all students. And so you think not just people in wheelchairs, but like a person who even has like knee problems or leg problems, you know, um, I've had some students who've had different, like, uh, issues with their legs or knees, whether it's, you know, you, you've broken something or whatever, that climbing stairs was very difficult for them, and so they were allowed to use the elevators. But it's, it's there for that reason. Or maybe even you have a heart issue, you know, and it will get your heart beat up too much. And, uh, but at any rate, so this is designed to physically and mentally protect people, uh, protect people. So just as a general rule, and this is some life advice, when you go into an interview, you only need to tell them things that will help, unless it is something that you legally have to disclose, but you only need to tell them things that will help you get hired. Yeah. Uh, I, or, you know, I tend to get stomach viruses a lot. I'm going to be out a lot. No, you, know, you tell them things that you only legally have. You'd be surprised at some of the things people will say in interviews. I'm just going to, that you're like, okay, that was not smart. But anyway. You want to put your best 
foot forward. All right, so let's talk about the Persian Gulf crisis. Meet Saddam. Saddam Hussein, he's an interesting little butterfly, isn't he? So he really, did, he has a very, okay, so what was it? Somebody on Friday said, and I wish I remembered who, somebody's sitting right over here, and I want to say it was the other class. I want to say it was Gutter said that he looked like if, if George Lopez and, um, hang on, Steve Harvey had a love child. <laughs> I was like, I cannot unsee that now. It's the mustache. It is It is the Steve Harvey mustache. So, but it is a very impressive mustache. Boys, if you can ever grow that one, you may want to. Otherwise, you know. Stay away from most of them. But, yeah. So, let's talk about this gentleman, or some Saddam Hussein. So, Saddam Hussein, uh, what's going on with him? What's his goal here? Well, he hates Kuwait, but he, he, or he wants Kuwait. Hang on. But he hates Israel. He has a hate for Israel. We have two major goals, right? Protect Israel. And have oil. And have oil. And he's going to kind of screw up both of them. He wants Kuwait. Why? Because he sees it, or he sees it as a place, um, of, like, it was carved out of the Iraqi coast, um, like, western region. And it, it kind of is. He feels like he deserves it, right? He feels like it's theirs, and it was taken away. And it is this oil-rich little place. So I want to show you a slightly bigger map here. So to kind of show you where some real hot spots in the world are and have been. I'm sure you've heard of Syria. There's been lots of genocide and other issues with Syria. Is Syria bad? It's been a pretty hot spot. Next to Syria, you have Iraq. And next to Iraq, you have Iran. And over here, you have Afghanistan, which we're not to yet. Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. Okay? Omen, um, Omen and Yemen, you don't really hear a lot about. They're pretty chill. Saudi Arabia is kind of an interesting little thing in itself, which we will save that for another conversation. Yes. You get on over in here, and you have Israel, which is also a very hot spot, and Jordan. And also, uh, Palestine is in here. And these areas all have conflicts with Israel, this little tiny spot, right? So let's come over here. Why is Israel here? Because of its, a lot of it's, its American connections. Israel had been, all right, so the land in Israel had belonged to Israel many years before. And in 1948, um, it was suggested that the land there be split between the Palestinians and the Israelis because post-Holocaust, all of these Israeli people had nowhere to go. And so they decided to kind of try to give them a homeland back. And so that turns into just a hotbed of mess uh, in a lot of ways. And so Israel, um, when you go in, and then they split the city of Jerusalem in half because that was also very important to both the Islamic faith and the Jewish faith. And so with that, uh, that is a very... Popular yet sometimes can be dangerous city. Although it seems like it's kind of been a little chill comparatively to how it was about 10 years ago. And so what you see in that area is you have two very tense groups in each other. All right. Now, let's come back up here. So you have Kuwait. And as you said, Kuwait feel, or, um, Iraq feels like they lost this little piece of Kuwait. That is an extremely wealthy, oil-rich country. So, coming back to Saddam Hussein and his impressive mustache. Saddam figures Kuwait really doesn't have that much of an army. And so, he just takes his guys and he marches in and takes it. He thinks nobody's going to ask. He thinks, you know, it's it's almost like the Hitler syndrome here, and I'm not calling him Hitler, but he's like, what are they going to do to him? You know, unless they want to go to war, what are they going to do? And... He kind of just marches on in and takes over. Well, it is going to be condemned not just by the U.S., but by the U.S., which we don't get the second war in Iraq, okay? Even, even the Soviet Union agrees. Not, not like the Soviet Union agrees. The Soviet Union agrees. Uh, everybody jumps in on this, and they're like, yeah, what you're doing to Kuwait is wrong. 
And so they give him an ultimatum. He needs to be out by January 15th. Basically, they evict him, you know. He gets an eviction notice. You're not out by January 15th. You're going to face the consequences. And he does not get out. So the war officially starts on January the 16th. So January the 16th, we start firing Patriot missiles. Yes. So tell me about the missiles. They're laser guided. So happy. Anytime they use lasers, it just makes me feel good. So they're laser guided missiles. Um, I remember this event very well. I was in middle school and uh, my American history teacher was an older gentleman. And he like, he was very, very patriotic. And like, it, I remember Americans tying yellow ribbons around trees as like a symbol for the soldiers that we love you at home. Uh, that used to be an old thing that people would do. It was based on this old like song that would say tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree. And it lets me know that you missed. It's kind of a, like when your soldier comes home, they see that it's like, Hey, we missed you while you were gone. And so there were yellow ribbons on everything as a sign of support. It was just a very patriotic feeling. Why? Because everybody around the world is like, this is wrong. It doesn't last very long. We don't mind wars if we win and they don't last long. And so, and a lot of Americans, I think too, felt guilt for how Vietnam had gone down and how the soldiers were treated. So it's very, very different. A couple of other key things I want to mention to you here about this. Uh, it comes to an end, but just to let you know, um, over 500,000, 539,000 to be exact, U.S. sailors, soldiers, and pilots fought or were at least stationed in this conflict. Now, a side note with that is that this is the first conflict where women were allowed to serve in combat. There had not been a women allowed in combat before. And so this is the first conflict where women were allowed to serve in combat positions. And so this was advancing rights for women and equality for women. And so this, this is a big deal. Now, when the war comes to an end in just a mere 37 days, Saddam surrenders. And remember, Daddy Bush is this policy expert, right? He was the head of the CIA. He makes a decision to not remove Saddam Hussein. At the end of the Iraqi war, his popularity rating was at the highest point ever. I remember like the feeling of just, it was a feeling of euphoria. I compare it to the Spanish American war. It was a feeling of euphoria. It was a feeling of victory. And then the decision is made to not re remove Saddam Hussein. But here was his reasoning. Daddy Bush said, if we do, we will be in Iraq for the next 10 years. Or more. Now, the interesting thing is we're going to go back and we're going to do it again. And it took us about 10 years to get their government stable. So he obviously knew what he was talking about. Yeah. And did he make the right decision or the wrong decision? I don't know. If we were going to go back anyway, yes. But he had no way to know that. You know, so it's a it's a catch-22. If he would... Catch-22 means both decisions are bad. Do what, hon? The second word. Itch. We'll get we'll get to that too. But it's a catch twenty two, and so he, it's a rock and a hard place. Is, that, is, this, is this where like the American sniper like that comes from the second? The second. I, I don't remember if that was set in Iraq or Afghanistan, but it's that time period. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. It was like a really big event because. There was such a big patriotic feeling. Yes. Country. It was like almost like a cherry on top. Yes. It's, and it's, it's, argue, it's still argued to be the best rendition it's of the, the national it's anthem true. ever. Um, now, to cap this off and to kind of finish here, this is, this is in, um, it actually comes to a head in the Persian Gulf a year before Bush's election. And so before his re-election. I think had it been 1992, January 1992, I still think he would have probably been reelected. But people forget those feelings, don't they? I mean, a year is a long time for people to forget, especially if it was only 37 days. So it's interesting to see what takes place after this. Uh, and I remember being very upset that Saddam Hussein was left in power. Now, I... How old were you? Probably 13. 
I was old enough. I don't mind. I was old enough to kind of know what was going on in politics and everything. And I just remember, I'm like, if he, if we've been told he's such a horrible person, why are we leaving him in power? Right. And you know, was he to that level? No, but he didn't have the, he didn't have the power that Hitler had, but he was not a good guy. I mean, he's going to end up eventually being uh, hung by an international tribunal for war crimes, you know? I mean, but still, having said that, I remember being very frustrated because it seemed like if he's so bad, then why are we letting him stay? You know, it's kind of like, go back, go home, take your toys. And so, again, I didn't understand the foreign policy implications of what overthrowing a leader means. And, you know, because Bush said if we just take him out and we don't reestablish a government, somebody will come in that is as bad, if not worse. So whether he was right or wrong, we will never know. All right. Uh, another individual that I want to point in to you, uh, George Bush also appoints the second African-American to be in the Supreme Court. Uh, this was a guy by the name of Clarence Thomas. And Clarence Thomas was, he replaced the first African-American who resigned. Uh, just, you know, you're in the Supreme Court until you die or quit. And so Thurgood Marshall, his health was failing. And so he resigned and Bush is going to replace him with Clarence Thomas. Clarence Thomas kind of becomes a controversial replacement because he, this is the first time in a case like this that we're going to hear the term sexual harassment. But it definitely will not be the last. Not even with the Supreme Court will it be the last. And so uh, there was a young lady who had worked in his in one of his law offices. Her name was Anita Hill. And she claimed that he had sexually harassed her. She made claims of sexual harassment. There is a very good, um, I don't remember if it was Showtime, but there was a, a kind of made-for-TV version type film made about this and about his experience. And, I enjoyed watching it because I just remember that she, he was accused of sexual harassment and then he got on the court. I love how the notes called, like, saying what, what he said. He got all of, like, so like, You're talking about Clinton. Talking about Clinton. Uh, yeah, we're not there yet. It, well, and that's why it's kind of funny because I remember this is kind of the first time you start hearing about, like, sexual harassment and then Clinton comes in. And it's a whole nother game. Like, that makes what happens with Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas seem kind of low key. And Hillary still both happy family, so it wasn't an Instagram. Yes. Kind of feel that zone. You know, that's a. I am sure there have been some bad days. Either that or like you have to have the most in the aisle possible. But I'm sure there have been some bad days in the, the Clinton house. All right. So, anyway, the election of 1992. The election of 1992. So going into this election, Bush was pretty popular still. Like, he wasn't, like, in, you know, this unbelievably low approval rating. And usually people will reelect a president that at least does an okay job. Why? I mean, okay over the unknown, right? You know, there's one of those things like... Um, when, and and you will understand this, that whether it be bosses or whatever, there's, you know, when you work in, for someone and you've worked for them for a long time, you know what to expect. Somebody new comes in, even if it's somebody new that you know and you like, you don't know what's going to happen when they are in that position. And so it's kind of surprising, however, something that I, I started kind of studying about when I was in college and started looking at elections. Any time you have any sort of split, it hurts a party. Now, let me introduce to you Texas billionaire Ross Perot. I um, I actually kind of, I, I remember thinking Perot was more of a joke when I was, um, well, in 92. But I kind of started to where I kind of like Perot. Um, I want you to listen to him speak. Now, he is going to sound as country as the day is long. But I want you to listen to what he has to say. He looks like he should be an army general and not the president. To be honest. He just died kind of recently, too. Uh, there is so much waste around here. And again, every time you get into see, I'm the only guy that talks numbers. I love this. Nobody else will even talk about it. It's like, I've said it's like a crazy aunt in the basement. Everybody knows she's there, but nobody talks about it. I'm talking about it. 
then I can talk, you know, with endless numbers about it. And then when I finish, typically the establishment press said, he didn't tell us enough. I just break up. Nobody else said anything. And I haven't said enough. Let me just talk in general terms today, since no matter how many numbers I give the press right now, it doesn't satisfy. Number one, we cannot spend our children's money. We are looking on the edge of a revolution of young people who are starting to realize that we, our generation, yeah, put them $4 trillion in debt, and they don't like it, and they shouldn't. Don't we love our children as much as our parents loved us? Sure we do. We cannot spend their money. Now then, that's the easy decision. The hard decision is how do you fix it? You've got to have, instead of a deteriorating job base in the economy, which is what the last 12 years have given us, we've got to have, first, you've got to stop the, the decline, stabilize it, turn it into a growing job base, growing industrial base. The only way to do that is to make the finest products in the world. Now, that's something I know a lot about. We've got to put everybody that's breathing back to work in a good, solid job. Then you've got a growing tax base. But in the meantime, you've got to have a real grab and run one that stops the deficit spending. So you don't lose any more financial blood. <clears throat> then with a the growing tax base, you pay off $4 trillion, and we leave the American dream to our children, which we all want. So he said, hey, we need to pay off this debt that we've racked up. And I didn't have it. But uh, actually, every time I listen to him speak, like especially now looking back, he predicted like the recession that was going to happen. He predicted the real estate crisis. He's like, if we keep doing this, this is going to take place. And it's not that he's psychic. It's that he understands basic economics. And, you know, would it be smart, perhaps, to have people in the presidency, just as a general rule, that understand economics? Or have, like, a degree in college. I mean, you know, well, actually, every president since Harry Truman has had a degree. But what is that degree? And that degree doesn't mean, like, you've done intensive studies on economics and on world affairs and politics. It could be, you know, this is your degree in underwater basket week in it. And so I just, I always like to listen to Perot. Uh, in Saturday Night Live, when they made fun of Perot, uh, they talked about how he looked like Yoda with his ears that kind of stuck out. So they always picked at him pretty good. Um, the deficit is the national debt. Uh, a deficit, what the term literally means is if you do all of your expenses and all of your bills and you have, or, I'm sorry, all of your money that's coming in and all of your expenses. If you have more bills than you have money coming in, you have a deficit. That means you don't have enough, right? So it's like negative money. Yeah. Yes. If you have more money coming in than you have bills, you have what's called a surplus. And so he was saying that what, we, what we're leaving our children with is they're having to make up if we pay off this debt, which that's a whole other complicated economic principle about the deficit is really mainly money to ourselves. So. You know, it's it's complicated, but he's saying if we let that keep growing, that eventually makes it harder on our generations. Well, we technically just like just like give the money for that. Like, well, most of the money is like owed to the government. Like, can we just be all right right now? Do we have enough money? To do that? No. Well, okay. Not and do the other things that we do. So basically, the deal is that, like things like, for instance, just to give you one example, student loans. That's money that the government basically created. Okay. And if those aren't paid back, which obviously if you pay any attention to the news, that can be a big issue. Then any money that's not paid back, that's a deficit. Why? Because you don't have the money coming in to make up what you have. And so if that money's not coming in through taxes and tariffs, if that would have been my household, I'd have to either A, find a way to make more money, or B, cut some of my expenses, right? But the government, this national government, they're, we, they don't have to do that. <clears throat> because realistically, our money is valuable because we and other people think it is. Right, that's really what it's, I mean, it's, it is what it is. It's a created concept. Bold yeah. Bold. Now, I know, like, last year, um, I was reading something that, Grace's dad had mentioned, and I don't remember, it was something that they had to cut, and he said, Mississippi doesn't have the luxury of creating our own money. We can't, you know, we can't write checks that aren't good. Does that make sense? Because we aren't the federal government. The federal government can do that because they create the money, right? But the state government can't just say, well, we're going to spend $500,000 we don't have. And I bet if they create the money, they'll be the law. It does. And the more, like, that that can cause inflation, which inflation is okay, 
if it's at a regular rate, it's not okay if it is. Yes. Can they like stop for a bit, like making money for a bit, or is that like? It's. Or that like wreck stuff up like the boat did. It well, it's not that. It's not that simple. Um, it, have you taken economics yet? No, I'm here. Yeah, if you take a, a really strong economics class, which um, he he does a great job. If but if you take a really strong economics class, you're going to get into how a lot of it works, and it doesn't have to be complicated. I'll be honest with you: there are parts of economics that are very complicated, but parts of it are more simplistic. And even how he broke this down about you can't ignore this and expect everything else to be okay. You know, it'll it goes into that and the different economic theories with it. All right, so. Um, anyway, that was Perot. I, I do love to use Perot because it kind of gives you a feel for him. Because what he said makes sense. He got a decent amount of popular vote. Uh, between 10 and 20 percent, if my memory serves me correctly. However, he doesn't get electoral votes. Mainly because usually when you have third party candidates, usually they're more regionally appealing. Does that make sense? Like. You know, maybe they, like in the South, a lot of times they would vote for people who were pro-state rights. And so they would get electoral votes because there would be enough people to vote for them. But he's kind of an overall appeal, but he's not main party. So he doesn't get electoral votes, but he does rock the popular vote. And the thought is that because he is appealing more to your business group, usually that group tends to side with the Democrats or the Republicans. Who, which party usually plays more into the business of America's business and trying to keep business running and lower tariffs? Who is that? Or higher tariffs? That's going to be a Republican Party. And so with him coming in as that heavy business candidate, who's he going to pull from? He's going to pull from the Republicans. And so the thought is here, and I didn't really understand this until I was a little older and started studying the election, is that the reason Bush lost, more than likely, is that Perot pulled those votes. Does that make sense? Because if the Democrats, uh, the Democrats more are social programs, the Republicans more are about cutting expenditures, helping business, because if business is running, you have more tax dollars coming in, et cetera, et cetera, right? So check this out. Also, if you're putting people to work, do you need as many of the social programs? No. So some of those go away. So the idea here is when Perot runs, listen, it changes the election. And it probably shifts Bush, who was not an extremely unpopular president, out of the White House. And you have this young, cool governor from Arkansas, William H. Clinton. And Clinton kind of tries, he comes across as a much younger and kind of fun candidate. And I have a particular video to show you. I remember this very well. And this is a recording of Clinton playing the saxophone on the Arsenio Hall show. <laughs> So, I mean, not only does he play the saxophone, he comes out in the Ray Band. You know, he's got a whole look going there. And it makes him seem younger than Bush. Oh, my gosh, I'd have to look it up because Hillary was 70 when she ran for the last election in um, 2016. So now she would be like 74. So how old, let's see, if he's 74 now, this was 92. That would approximately be 30 years ago. So he's young. He's 44. You know, he's a young guy. Um, not quite as young. Kennedy was still the youngest, but I believe he was younger than Obama when Obama was elected. They had a daughter. Um, they still have a daughter. But Chelsea. OK, so Chelsea, um, you know, here's the thing. So there are certain stages in life 
that are just rough. <laughs> All right? Chelsea's daddy decides to run for office. When her dad was, and these are some of the more recent ones of her, where she is very, very pretty. I want to find like 13-year-old Chelsea. Oh, you're going to be black. Yeah, Megan. So this is not a bad one of her, uh, but this, here's the, here's the, yeah. <laughs> Does it remind you of Finding Nemo, though? Yeah. <laughs> and, like, the acne was bad. It's just her age. Yeah. It's just her age. And she really does. She turns into this beautiful woman. But, like, and, like, and that's that age, too, where a lot of times, like, especially if you don't know, curly hair people, it's work, like, to know how to fix curly hair. And she really hadn't learned how to fix curly hair. And Hillary didn't have curly hair, so she wouldn't any help. And so, like, sometimes Chelsea would come out where you could tell she put the wrong product on it and her hair just would look really greasy. And then she's got all the zits and then the braces. And it was just not Chelsea's best years. Oh, yeah. Like, this is not her best shot. But see, like, here, I think she turned into a beautiful woman. But, like, it, it's the most awkward time of your life. And so things like Saturday Night Live and things, this was back when it was fun to make fun of people. And so they would make horrible fun of her, and it's just not nice. Well, it wasn't nice then, but now we anti-bully, so, you know. But at any rate, so SNL what, and other things were horrible to poor, poor Chelsea. Uh, and like I said, I think she turned into an absolutely gorgeous woman. And But you can just see that there were some, there were some years that were hard for her. And I was trying to see, there was one particular that I, I used to use, but... It was a rough time. So here they come into the White House. They're a new family. It's the first family that has had a young ch younger daughter, really, since Carter. And so anytime you have, especially teens in the White House, they are like under the microscope, you know, because your life is no longer private. Everything you do is very, very public. And so I always feel for those kind of people and, and the lives that they have. All right. So anyway... Uh, some other things about Clinton. Let's start out with some of his policies. Uh, he he hires the first female attorney general. This is Janet Reno. Janet's a tall lady. If you can't tell, Bill Clinton is like 6'2". She's as tall as he is, if not taller. And on Saturday Night Live, she was played by Will Ferrell. And this particular picture shows where she and Will Ferrell are about the same height. Uh, we're having a historical experience in the screens room. Hello. Abdiel? Okay, thank you. Abdiel, go home. All right, so... I was right on it. I was thinking it was 6'2". Yeah. So my, you get right every so often. Uh, so not as tall as Dr. Ross. Dr. Ross is 6'5". But Dr. Ross is tall. Um, there was a whole discussion in my fourth block one day where one of my students wanted to know if she had ever played center for a basketball team. And so Dr. Ross and I have been friends for a long time. So I text her and I'm like, hey, you want a candid interview? And she came in and she's like, what do you want to know? And she said that she actually played college ball for one day. Uh, because she was at a junior college, and the coach came in and said, I need you for my team. And then he realized that she really was the least athletic person he had ever coached. And so he and she both agreed that this was not a fit. All right. So anyway, uh, but, yeah, so Janet Reno comes in. She is the first female attorney general for the U.S. Attorney general, to answer your question, Fabian, that was the position that Bobby Kennedy held for John F. Kennedy. Yes, they would handle legal matters. and Yeah. So that's a big position that had never gone to a female before. Now, it is under Clinton. It is under Clinton that a new policy is passed. And I guess, too, you are in a different generation, so it's hard for you to understand how this was progressive at the time. So up until before the Clinton administration, Clinton passed an executive order called Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It was huge. Before the Clinton administration, when you would sign on for the military, you would go in, 
And you would go through a series of different things. And one of the questions is, are you gay? And um, if you said yes, you were not allowed to join the military. Okay. If you said no, you lied on your admissions forms. Even if you were gay, why would you not? Why would you put yes? Right. And so a lot of people didn't. But if you got caught, well, you were dishonorably discharged, which means you lose your benefits and all that kind of stuff. Are they, were they like afraid of like there being distraction? I no. I think what it, it just was, it was an old dated rule. I, I think it's this idea that they were afraid with all of these people or, you know, if you know much about like boot camp and these things, there's, uh, you have community showers. You have, you know, you're always sleeping in close quarters, and I guess they just thought that these people could. hurting anyone. Let them do what they want. Well, but you're also. And they're off duty. And again, I don't disagree with you, but it was a different era. You know? However, so Clinton comes up with a policy that's a transition, and it was don't ask, don't tell. So nobody can ask you. You don't need to tell anybody, and as long as you don't get caught, you can be gay. Now, when I say this, every time students are like, that's no better. Well, it actually was. It's an improvement where at least you're not having to lie. You just don't tell. You know? And you could actually say, if you were questioned, you could say, look, I don't have to answer that question, whether you were or weren't. And so it's, is it the arriving at the promised land of equality for homosexuals in the military? No. But it's at least moving a step forward. It is the right direction. And so uh, this is this is a huge moment. I love the Clinton coffee cup here that says, "If you should screw up at work, just remember my new policy: don't ask, don't tell." So, which becomes a lot more fun soon. So let's talk about a couple of other Clinton policies. Um, the Clintons, together, while he is president, work for Universal Health Care. Now, this is we know this does not happen yet. Uh, because you do not get the option at Universal Health Care until the Affordable Health Care Act. But what the Universal Health Care Program was, it was kind of a complicated plan. Uh, Hillary really writes most of it. She wrote most of the bill. It goes to Congress, and it is a huge bust. Uh, it did not pass, but this was Clinton's big promise with his election, is that he would pass um, Universal Health Care, which he is not at the time where Americans are willing to support it. Congress didn't vote for it. Um, to be fair, at the time, Clinton has a Congress that is the opposite party, and typically parties don't support across party lines, very rarely, as it's very obvious right now. And so that is just kind of those party politics. Uh, it was, from what I remember about it, what I've studied about it, it was extremely complicated. Hillary was extremely unpopular with the American public because like how many first ladies are writing the policies like you could see like the president writing bills or the, proposing bills but for the first lady to do it uh, it was not the most popular thing and and this is y'all are going to find this funny but another big criticism of the Clinton family is how they didn't seem bill was very warm like when you watch him on tv he looks cool when you hear him talk bill clinton was both brilliant and down to earth at the same time like he was a Rhodes scholar uh, if you don't know what a Rhodes scholar is it's a pretty huge deal and it, i mean you can't just like be a moron and get a Rhodes scholar but hillary came across as very cold and even if you watch her like in 2016 when she's running for president she doesn't come across as like the warm grandma that bakes cookies it's just not who she is. And, you know, and that's okay. Sometimes that's not your person, right? You know, some people just know they don't come across as friendly and that's not naturally who she is. And so uh, they actually, one of the criticisms that was made of the Clintons, they were the first family in years that did not have a dog in the White House. They had a cat. That makes sense. And it's hard to get emotionally attached to socks, the cat. And so, uh, so towards the end of Clinton's presidency in his second term, he got a brown, he got a chocolate lab, which was the most popular dog in America at the time and named him buddy because what sounds more, I mean, that sounds like Bill, right? This is my buddy, you know? And so he has this big brown chocolate lab that's running around. So that made them seem a little more approachable. And, you know, because you're coming after the bushes who had all these beautiful Cocker Spaniels and they were these cute little dogs, right? And so here's Socks the Cat. 
And as you know, Americans generally rights for socks the cat. Rights for socks the cat. <laughs> rights for the cat lady, right? So at any rate. And all that sounds so stupid, but isn't that how politics works sometimes? Yeah, what do I do my grandmother loved Barbara Bush because she raised Cocker Spaniels and my grandmother used to raise Cocker Spaniels. Absolutely. Use your checkers dog. Absolutely. Why? Because we love animals and we make decisions based on dumb and irrational things sometimes. All right. The temporary aid for needy families. Another thing Clinton does that makes him considered to be more of a middle of the road conservative. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, liberal is that he helps to pass TANF. What this does is it limits the amount of time that a person can be on welfare. And so that's why the word temporary is in there. Uh, why would you want to do this? <clears throat> what is the criticism with people who are not fans of wealth uh, of, of welfare and other government entitlement programs? What is the criticism? Uh, taxpayers. taxpayers, but... Yes, you don't want to create dependency, right? So, you know, the idea is let's make this temporary. Let's make this a handout, right? That was the idea behind TANA is to shorten the amount of time so you knew this is not, okay, I get this for the next 50 years. And so TANF was designed to limit how long that a family could receive it. And it was not like six months or anything like that. It was, it was, a, it was I believe, two years. Uh, but it's designed to kind of help to end that cycle, going back to Johnson and that cycle of poverty. Uh, you don't want the persistence of poverty, but at the same time, like you said, you don't want to create a system where people just abandoned. take, yeah, where they abandon. You said there's no incentive to work, you know, so you want to, it's one thing when there are no jobs to be had. It's another thing when you refuse to work. And so that's what they're trying to do with TANF is to uh, stop that dependency issue. All right, so a uh, couple other things. Uh, it is during Clinton's administration that the world begins to get on the World Wide Web. Um, I remember AOL used to get these these discs that would come in the mail, and it's like, sign up for AOL for free. We try to get you to log in. And then eventually AOL went to AOL Messenger. And it was this whole thing and Windows. And I remember the first computer that I had that was connected to the internet. And then I have to like log in and have like a horrible sound. Well, you would have to connect through a phone, phone cable. Like yeah. I had a big box computer that would do that yes. horrible sound with that background. And I'm having flashbacks now. Yeah, you would tap, you would uh, plug in. You would plug in the wire that was from your phone. You would take it out of your phone and make all this stuff. And it would go on for like forever while it's connected. And then once you would get connected, you would sometimes pages would take minutes to load. Like I remember like um, I was doing a project for college. And I remember like putting on, I was trying to get on the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum webpage for some stuff I wanted to print. So I would pull it up. And then I'd go in the other room and do something and come back, you know, and it would be up. And so then I would print something and printing was like, and it would print like one little line at a time, even of a picture. And so it takes forever. So like I would have all these other projects going on at the same time that things were loading and printing and, and it would take hours to do just regular stuff. I distinctly remember that graph background. It's, yeah. It's better than <laughs> I, I love this because it is like, it is my, it's my college experience. And AIM Instant Messenger, good times. All right. So uh, another huge program that passes shortly after Clinton takes office is NAFTA, North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement, which has been back in the news kind of recently. Uh, Trump and it took on NAFTA. NAFTA is very controversial. Um, it depends on who you're speaking with is as if the NAFTA was a good policy. So North American free trade. So what that means is it eliminated tariffs between the U.S., Mexico, and Canada. Ross Perot described it as this. this is why I love Ross Perot. There will be a job-sucking sound going south. What does that mean? Not that they're coming, 
Well, that jobs are going to go to Mexico because the minimum wage is lower. The, the pricing floor, what you have to pay, and then also all the taxes and things that the businesses have to pay are much lower in Mexico. And so a corporation can move to Mexico. My small town lost all the major industries there but one. Now, they didn't have an industry near as big as Ingalls or Chevron, but there were several industries. At uh, Russell Athletics, they moved. They moved to Mexico. Uh, Maples Carpets are the only one that stayed. Axon Noble moved to Mexico. And why? Because they can hire people there for cheaper and make more money. And so in a lot of small towns, they lose those in industries. And so NAFTA is very, very controversial, as I said, still today. Uh, it's good for business. It's bad for workers. So, all right.